comes to um, uh, when, it, when it comes to insulin therapy. So before we start, uh, um, I just uh, I, I just want your uh, help to scan this QR code and try to answer the question here. So like, what what do you think? If if you're given a three option, uh, what do you think is the top three issue or top three challenges to insulin treatment um, in your practice? Maybe I give about um, um, one minute for this or maybe less. Mm, less, the, less the responses. Uh, do you all help? Yeah, hold on. Uh. Uh, what happened? Uh, do you all have managed to uh, uh, scan the QR code? Uh? Yeah, and then try to answer the question. Okay, I'll give maybe another half a half a minute, and then we will review the response now. Okay, yeah, let's see the response. Um, so I have thirteen response so far. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, surprisingly, I mean, or not surprisingly, um, the, the, the leading responses here is a lack of monitoring capabilities, um, followed by hypoglycemia and weight gain, which I'm sure we all have the same problem as well, um, as well as treatment initia due to fear. Uh, I think treatment initia can be multi multifactorial, can be because of fear of injection, can be because of the hassle, uh, patient don't want the hassle of insulin injection or hassle of uh, hassle of uh, insulin um, injection during work, for example. Um, um, I I think the other less common answers would be like slow titration, SMBG takes too long to interpret, as well as um, cost of insulin and SMBG. Let's just go through one by one. Huh? Okay. Um, like I said, I, I will address some of the issues regarding uh, insulin therapy, but I can't promise I will solve all of them. And in fact, if we go, if we were to go through all the challenges of insulin, insulin therapy, I think this might be a very long uh, lecture. Yeah. So first, um, how good is insulin? Um, I think insulin is easier said than done, actually. So like when you say like if you have uh, advanced diabetes or, or progressive beta cell decline, all patient with type 2 diabetes will eventually require insulin. Um, and we also know that we have been using more insulin uh, over the years. This paper by Dabcare, um, led by Prof Mahfazi, showed that we have been using more insulin actually between uh, 2008 to 2013. Um, the use of uh, basal bolus insulin has almost doubled in the in the Dabcare cohort. But if you look at the HbA1c, right, it remains the same. No? Um, it remains about 8.66 to 8.52. And this is despite an increase, um, more use of uh, basal bolus insulin and the proportion of patients who reach the get of HbA1c less than 7 also doesn't seem to increase much just, just by only 1% from 22.8 to 23.8. Um, understandably, uh, one might argue that because that care was done in a tertiary center, the patient might be of, uh, of more uh, advanced uh, disease stage. They might have um, more comorbidities, for example, so they might not aim for HbA1c of less than seven. But if you look at HbA1c less than eight, also right, um, actually there's no much difference also from 44 to um, 47.6. And I just show you another uh, issue uh, demonstrated in in other real world uh, settings. Huh? the first one is from the impact database, and this is a database insurance database that look at uh, insulin users. In, uh, in, in, in insurance uh, database in the US. Um, and this included about 4,800 4, patients. And they found that the average insulin persistence, meaning that patients who still inject insulin one year after they were started on insulin was only about 65%. And what they also found was that non-persistence of insulin treatment was associated with an increase in the number of hospitalization increase in the number of um, diabetes related hospitalization as well as an increase in the number of emergency department visits. Yeah. In another um, real world database uh, cohort, uh, this is from the JET, uh, which I think Dr. Lim Liling and Alex Tan was involved uh, in, in this time. Uh, they look at the subset of JET patients who were using uh, insulin at the time and they, they managed to get about almost 19,000 patients and 
Um, JIT is a database that includes uh, East Asian countries like, like Hong Kong, um, a bit of Malaysia as well. And they found that most patients uh, use either a pre insulin, uh, which is up to about almost 44%, uh, basal insulin 41.6%, and basal bolus um, is not a lot, it's just about, just about 10% only. But if you look at the real world data for JIT, uh, the mean HbA1c is also about the same, 8.74. Just in fact, it's actually worse than our our dead care um, HbA1c actually. And they also found that patients who have young onset diabetes and women are less likely to reach target. And another other finding that they found was that women and people with diabetic kidney disease, despite adjustment for their uh, duration of diabetes and all right, and other and other variables, they found that these people. Uh, women and people with diabetic diseases are also at higher risk of self-reported hypoglycemia as well. So, of course, what are the challenges that we find? I mean, it's going to be endless. It's going to be an endless uh, list now. But um, I just highlight one of the few of the common things that um, that I I felt during my practice. Of course, your practice might be a bit different from what I do. Um, so, many patients that I find they 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 have resistance because of the fear of um, injection or because they just too busy lah. For example, like they, they need they want to focus on the exam. Sometimes I see master student who 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 also who have uh, diabetes and they need to be started on insulin, but they want to focus on their master's exam first. And um, of course, hypoglycemia is always an issue. Hypoglycemia and weight gain is always an issue. But um, I personally I don't find um, weight gain or not many of my patients complain of weight gain so much of an issue, but hypoglycemia is definitely is an issue. Um, and of course, when you talk about insulin treatment, uh, um, it's easy to give prescribed insulin and take off your, take off, take, take our hands off, but it's not going to work that way. But the actual effective insulin treatment is rather quite a complex treatment. And this requires SMBG, requires self titration. And for many patients and some doctors also, they might find this um, treatment regime a bit, uh, too complex for, their, for them to grasp. Nah. And we there's always the cost of insulin and glucose monitoring. So because here we use a lot of human insulin, so the cost of human insulin might not um, pinch that much, but when you counter, counter in the SMBG, cost of SMBG, and, and the cost of, let's say, hypoglycemia, the cost of hospital visit, uh, things can get really snowball uh, rather quite quickly. And then when you switch to analog, then it depends on the dose. The higher the dose that they use, the more cost that, that, that they have to pay. Um, it's not unusual to have patients who, who, who use high doses of insulin and lock uh, to pay almost the same price as uh, GIP-1 receptor agonist treatment, about seven eight hundred uh, per month like that, just for their insulin treatment alone. And at the end of the day, uh, um, multiple trials have shown that insulin do not have any cardioprotective effect. It does lower HbA1c. It does uh, prevent diabetes complication um, related to the HbA1c um, lowering, but by itself, insulin does not have um, cardioprotective or renoprotective effect um, by, 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 by virtue of itself. Lah. Okay, I'll just go through some of these uh, common issues and some of the available, available literatures. Huh? Um, in this, uh, sorry, in this paper, how do I do this? They, they look at the, the fear of insulin injection and what is associated with a uh, increased pain, uh, and what they look at uh, is the needle length. As you can see, uh, longer needle is associated with a uh, worse visual analog score for pain as compared to shorter needle. Um, and now we have four millimeter needle as well, as well as uh, thicker needle like the like the um, the lower G needle lah, uh, yeah, um, has uh, more pain as compared to the higher like 31G needle or now we have 32G as well that we have um, less pain actually. And then uh, I'm sure you all are very familiar with this uh, treatment algorithm. Uh, this is from ADA, the left, the first one is from ADA, the second one is from EASD. Uh, I, I just want to show the big picture of it because I'm not going to go through um, the small, small detail on how to adjust insulin therapy here because here we are going to talk about the complexity or the challenges uh, for insulin treatment. And I do find this is one of the challenges that this insulin treatment is just way more complex than let's say SCAT2 treatment or, or GF1 
P1 receptor agonist treatment or the PP4 arm inhibitor treatment. If you look at the ADA algorithm, it's, it's a very long winded algorithm for injectable. Um, although the AACE looks a bit simpler, but it's also not that simple as well. And when you look at the evidence based uh, algorithm for, for even for, let's say, basal uh, titration, for example, uh, it's just as equally as messy. So you can see like there are multiple uh, clinical trial that look at different ways to titrate insulin. And because the ADA, recommend, ADA rec recommended that we use a, a, a what they call as evidence-based uh, titration method, right? Technically, any of this is an evidence-based um, titration method. It's just that there are different types and which one do you use? Do you need to know all of it? Do you just need to familiar, familiarize yourself with one or two methods of it? So these are what I find a lot of people um, not very familiar with. Okay, but I do feel that there are um, ways to sort of like macam overcome these issues. Yeah. Um, most importantly, I feel um, that a good uh, support system where you need a system, for example, if let's say you have a patient who, who are started on insulin, right? How do you plan to provide support system for this patient? And this is what I will go through on what we do have here. Uh, in my practice and I mean I can give you some ideas some suggestion that you may or may not find it useful uh, at the end of the day this is this is a sharing session yeah okay first uh, overcoming fear of insulin um, how do we overcome fear this is this is a difficult question like, because some patients they just simply don't want, don't want to inject insulin but I do find the concept of uh, motivational interviewing helps okay so what is motivational interviewing? It's basically a concept of where you want to promote uh, behavioral change, but using the patient's own motivation or the patient's own um, willingness to change. Okay. Um, and what I do find uh, helpful is um, not for us to tell the patient uh, why they should change, but you need to discuss in a way that you bring the discussion to the patient so that they themselves tell you why they should, why they need to change, and this this often brings up the when they themselves uh, mention the idea that they need to change. Okay, I need to start injecting insulin. I need to intensify my diabetes treatment, for example, lah. And they are more likely to be open to to treatment um, intensification. For example, um, I I think this question uh, I use a lot. Like, how satisfied are you with your current diabetes therapy? Do you think your diabetes treatment is good enough? Do you think you should do more with your diabetes treatment? Um, and I do have a lot of patients uh, who tends to blame their, their diabetes treatment on their lack of diet control or lack of exercise. And I do, in, in, when, when I deal with that kind of scenario, I try to bring the discussion to their BMI or their body weight. For example, um, some of these patients, their BMI is already lean actually. It's just that they don't want to intensify treatment or they are a bit resistant to intensify treatment, right? You say, I never mind, doctor, I will just go back and maybe eat less carbohydrate or take diet, uh, be more strict about my diet or exercise more, for example. Lah. And then I bring up the question, what do you think is your BMI? Do you think you are overweight? Do you think you are underweight? Do you think you need to eat less? Do you think you need to eat more? Or do you think you should maintain what you are eating right now? Um, do you think by currently you are already overeating or do you think you are eating like normally at this time, do you think eating by eating less, do you think it's going to really help with your diabetes treatment or do you think we should maybe provide more or better treatment uh, for your diabetes? Uh? And sometimes there are past experience, for example, like their parents, their families, their friends um, who might have uh, issues with uh, injectable like hypoglycemia um, and other complications as well. Um, and then you want to ask about what are the obstacles, about their work, about their lifestyle, whether they are going to eat outside, they, whether there's going to be a stigma about insulin injection, whether there's anyone who stay with them who can rescue them in case of severe hypoglycemia. Sometimes students who stay in hostel, their friends might not know that they are injecting insulin uh, or they might not want their friends to know that they, are, they, are, they have diabetes and that's why they don't want to inject insulin because their blades are easier to hide. Uh, and then what information and support system? Um, do they, would, they, would they prefer to have? Lah. Okay, and I like this diagram. It sort of like summarizes what um, the core issue in, 
in uh, treatment in Asia, especially with uh, insulin therapy, and then how to overcome the treatment in Asia. So when you talk about therapeutic in Asia, you're talking about maybe burdensome regimens, uh, fear of injection, um, negative appraisal of insulin. Sometimes we just don't take time to communicate better with patients. Sometimes we just don't take time to address their problems, find their obstacles, find why they they have issues with injecting insulin, or, or we just simply don't ask about side effects. Lah. And then if we do have to take our time to identify this issue, right? Maybe we can try to figure a solution for them. If let's say they do have side effect, maybe we can offer better therapy. We can offer insulin uh, and modern insulin, for example. Um, if they have a uh, fear of injection or, or, or negative perception about, about insulin, maybe you can get a support from a psychologist or maybe you can let a, you can have a nurse-led management. Sometimes better device, better monitoring, better system and uh, mobile apps, uh, better DSME program uh, might help in this kind of cases. Um, I like this paper which was very recently uh, presented in the ADA. Uh, this was published in May uh, this year. Um, they look at a systematic review of all the strategies at overcoming therapeutic inertia in people with type 2 diabetes. And what they found was that um, they divided into four. Pharmacist-based intervention, care management and patient education, physician-based intervention, as well as uh, nurse or uh, CDE-based intervention. And they found that physician-based intervention uh, is actually the least effective when it comes to overcoming treatment in Asia. So you might as well just refer to your nurse or refer to a pharmacist. They would do a better job at addressing treatment in Asia than doctors themselves. And when you look at what do they mean by these types of intervention, uh, when we talk about pharmacist-based intervention, they are talking about interventions led by pharmacists uh, to provide medication therapy management services and that enables autonomy to provide review and guideline-based uh, recommendation. Care management is basically care, man, uh, care management and coordination, virtual coaching, patient education or support program. Um, nurse or CDE-based intervention would be what our nurses would do. Lah. Like macam interventions, education, uh, use evidence-based protocol to provide diabetes management. Physician-based intervention is basically what we do. Um, intervention based to influence physician uh, behavior by in-person training. Um, and in uh, last year also, ADA published uh, their, or released their consensus uh, statement on diabetes self-management uh, management, uh, education and support services. Um, and they suggest, they recommend that you want to refer for diabetes self-management um, education at the diagnosis of diabetes annually and when not meeting treatment targets, when complicating factors develop and when transition in life and care occurs. Lah. And this especially so when you start a patient on insulin, and again, um, sorry, yeah. Hello? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll let you. I think I'll let you. I think I'll let you. Just open. I'm, I'm in a video of a lecture. No, I am in a video of a lecture. The patient is not coming. Okay, sorry. Um, so they rec ADA recommends that you refer patients for diabetes, uh, for diabetes self-management education and support at diagnosis annually and when not meeting treatment targets, when complication uh, develops as well as when transition in life from pediatric to adulthood and from adulthood to older age um, occurs. And this also um, happens or this, this also required when you switch a patient to from oral agent to start insulin therapy, when you switch between insulin regime, when the patient develop complications from insulin, for example, like hypoglycemia, for example, or they develop weight gain, when they want to learn about insulin titration, when there's lack of efficacy for insulin treatment, for example, when you start them on insulin by A1C is still high, when they plan to fast, when they plan to exercise, when they are, when they are having sick day, for example. So these are all um, occasions or these are all opportunities that you want to teach your patient. Of course, um, I always tell my patient that diabetes is not a process where you will see um, your nurse or you attend the education one time and you suddenly become an expert in it. It is a continuous uh, learning process. So you need to identify during the clinic visit, you need to identify what are the learning opportunities that you want to address at this point. Do you think you need to address about hypoglycemia? Do you think you need to address about injection technique? Do you think you need to address about fasting, Ramadan fasting? Do you need, think you need to address about travel or sick day or insulin titration or SMBG? Once you identify these uh, learning opportunities, then you refer to the nurse to 
learn about these learning opportunities and try to work on it step by step. So for example, um, in my clinic, I, we develop this uh, learning uh, materials or handout for patients. Like when we refer to them, when, 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 we, when we identify the issue, um, we refer to a nurse and then the nurse will teach them and then we will provide um, a leaflet to the patient. These are all printed as a, as a A5 size uh, handouts and then we give out to patient. So for example, if patient who has started on saphenyuria or who has started on insulin, I almost always give them this leaflet for hypoglycemia. So that before they develop hypoglycemia itself, they know how to recognize hypoglycemia, what hypoglycemia feels like and how to treat hypoglycemia correctly and not to over-treat hypoglycemia. When they are started on insulin, I always give them this basal insulin titration leaflet so that they know how to adjust um, their insulin leaflet. Of course, we have other leaflet as well, uh, but it's not within the context of today's lecture. This is other example of uh, education material um, uh, that uh, is that, that is uh, written by the NHS uh, for COVID time actually. So because during COVID time, they write on, they publish on how to, how to handle insulin users um, during sick days. So on the first page here, this is for type 1 diabetes. And on the second page, this is for type 2 diabetes. You can go and check out these um, two guidelines. Uh, you can just Google it, uh, NHS uh, COVID diabetes, and you will find this, these two uh, guidelines for both type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes as well for, for sick day. Um, sick day planning. Okay. Um, the next one I do find useful is also the use of a structured SMBG for people who, who, who use insulin. When we say structured SMBG, yeah, um, I often um, look at it as a SMBG system where you have a predefined uh, timing of uh, SMBG monitoring. You predefine the uh, frequency of uh, SMBG monitoring you predefine the target and then you predefine an action plan. So that when, then the patient will know how often they should check, what time they should check, what's their target they should get. And if they don't reach target, what are their action plan? If they get hyper or hypo, what are their action plan? And I also like this diagram. Um, this is developed by Roche actually in their, in their application that they want to push with their um, SMBG device. So they call this uh, system um, integrated Personalized Diabetes Management or IPDM. This is just a term that Roche used for their product. Lah. But in essence, what it does, it, it starts in this circle. And this is a good concept to suggest or to, to, to conceptualize that diabetes education is an ongoing education. So it's not like you learn structured education and then you go one way and then you stop at that and you stop learning. So it is a continuous education that you first you teach the patient and then patient do structured and therapy adapted SMBG, you do a structured documentation, analyze their reading, you personalize treatment and then assess the treatment efficacy and assessment. And then again, if you find problem, if you find treatment does not uh, reach your efficacy or assess, uh, treatment target, and then you again, you identify problem, identify opportunities for better self diabetes self-management. And then you again, you refer them for structured education and you repeat the cycle again. And this is a skill that patient with diabetes will need to learn over and over and over again throughout their life. Um, so having um, sort of like, like I'm trying out this uh, system by, by, the, by, by this uh, SMBG manufacturers, uh, I inevitably led down to this part of trying out other phone apps. Uh, and this is what I've done for the past uh, one year. I've tried and see different phone apps. Uh. I also highly recommend that you check out these apps. Uh. Okay. Um, first app here uh, uh, is AcuCheck Connect. This is an app by Roche, okay, for their device uh, called AcuCheck Guide. So this app only works with AcuCheck Guide. It does not work with the older AcuCheck because AcuCheck Guide is the only uh, SMBG device in for Malaysia consumer market that has a Bluetooth uh, capability. You can use this to enter manually from older uh, SMBG, but for Bluetooth wise and for synchronization purpose, only AcuCheck Guide works for this, okay. Contour Diabetes app My, okay, this one works with uh, Contour Plus One uh, devices. Okay, um, again, this is by Essentia. Uh, there are two types of Contour Plus, so you just need to be avoid to be confused with it. There are Contour Plus and Contour Plus One. The one with the Bluetooth capability is Contour Plus One, but you can use either Contour Plus Three, but you can still use it on the Contour Plus One device. Um, I personally use Contour Plus One the most in my practice. The reason being, okay, um, AcuCheck, sorry, 
acute connect ni they can uh, synchronize with uh, the patient's blood glucose but in order to generate the pdf report is rather a bit flimsy because you cannot generate a pdf report from the phone app itself you need to go to a pc or need to go to a browser on a pc or on a phone but and you can only generate the pdf report from the web browser itself whereas contour diabetes app can generate a pdf report from the app itself and i prefer this pdf report because we use emr and this pdf report can be uploaded directly to our emr and it does not have to go through this extra step of going to the browser there's another app called Health to Sync, and this is also important because I noticed some of my patients downloaded Health to Sync app. Health to Sync app is a third-party app that supports a long list of Bluetooth-enabled devices in Malaysia and outside of Malaysia. So it supports a wide range of devices, but the problem with Health to Sync app is that you need to pay. Okay, they only provide a free uh, report. You can only generate free report three times only. And after the three times, the fourth time you need to pay to get the pro version. But I think you can try to work with Essentia uh, company, right? Because they also have package that if you if they, your patient buy their Contour Plus One, they may also get a free version, a free pro version of uh, Health to Sing. But I have not actually uh, sort of like use it. Lah, yeah. Um, the last app is We Health. This is not uh, an app for for, for, for consumer use, but this is an app that we are developing in our hospital. Um, this, we plan to use this app for our patient with diabetes, and this is an app that uh, synchronizes their data from glucose uh, meter. Um, this uses the same algorithm or the same uh, uh, device as a EcoCheck guide, but in a more sort of like uh, intuitive and user friendly manner. Um, also, it includes blood pressure monitoring and other. The lifestyle activity but this is still in a very early uh, pilot staging uh, phase we are still testing the feasibility of it yeah um, so personal choice i prefer to use contour diabetes app but you can check on this app and you can check on their devices and you can decide which one do you think um, is your preference lah. for example this is one of my patients who use uh, contour uh, plus one and and this is a, a patient who came to me uh, in UMSC, who 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 whose daughter was actually a, one of our doctor in in UMMC, and then I asked why do you come to UMSC when you can get the same treatment for free in PPUM? So and then I told her just come and see me in PPUM. Um, his HbA1c was about eleven or twelve, I think. Sorry, I think it's about fourteen. Sorry, his HbA1c is fourteen, fourteen point two, and then I he was insulin naive at that time but was on maximum uh, oral therapy. So I started him on uh, Novomix, uh, eight unit at, at bedtime. And then three months later, he came back with this kind of glucose diary. So like this, he doesn't need to, um, uh, sort of like, he does not need to write in a diary, bring a book, because I see some patients, they need to bring the book, bring a pen, need to write their glucose every time they come to clinic, every time they go out, when they check the glucose, you need to write in a book. So like this, they just need to bring a small meter and their phone only because the, the reading will be synchronized uh, uh, automatically to their phone. And by this time, when the patient comes to see me, this is just yesterday only, on the August 4th, his latest HB1C was, was 7.2. 7.2. This is another patient that I saw, um, I think, uh, last week. Or was it last week? No, actually it was uh, last week or earlier this week. Um, young boy uh, who who had untreated diabetes for, for since he was 18 years old. So he was diagnosed at 18 years old. His sister also had a young onset diabetes, but for some reason he didn't get his, his, his because his, his, these are often children. Um, his uh, his uh, new parents, the, 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 the people that he's staying with, somehow just didn't bring him to get treatment for, for diabetes. And then when he come and met me, his HbA1c was also in the teens, I think it's about 14 as well. Um, and then we start. I started him on. Uh, initially, I started him on basobolus insulin, but he tried the basobolus, and then he felt that he's getting relative hypoglycemia. So eventually, he tried to cut down the bolus uh, doses. And this is the HbA1c that he came during the second visit. Uh, sorry, the SMBG that he came during the second visit. By this time, his HbA1c is already from fourteen dropped to eight point two. Yeah. So and then I told her that you just still need to work a bit on your diabetes, and hopefully. Um, his glycemic control will get better. Okay. This is another patient I saw in the clinic. Okay. Uh, 
from the look of it, right? From the look of it, can you guess that if this patient is type one or type two? Okay, because when you look at it, uh, you look at this this graph. It looks like a bit all over the place, right? Um, there's hypo here, there's hyper here, hyper, hypo again. It looks like it's a bit all over the place. And the reason why I asked this patient to do CGM is exactly because of that. Because his SABG is all over the place. Um, I don't always ask my patient to check four times in a day, but this is one of the few patients that I check ask to check like religiously four times in a day because I need to see a pattern and I still cannot see a pattern. By the way, this patient has type two actually. And this is one of the few patients that I use CGM for type two diabetes because usually we don't use one. Usually the usually the curve for type two uh, is a lot flatter than this one. Okay. This is one of those few patients where the curve goes like high like that, up and down. They are hypos, they are hypers. So um, when, you, when I look at the SMBG initially, it just doesn't show me any trend at all. So I, I told him, um, why do we try SGM because I need to see some trends. And then from his CGM, he did show that he has this hypoglycemia here, hypoglycemia here, some hyperglycemia here. But more importantly, I see this, that his target range is really 72%. And it's not bad at all. For someone who gets a lot of hypoglycemia, this is not bad at all. So I just need to work on this only, his TBR, which is 11%. I just need to reduce his hypoglycemia. His GMI at this time was 64%. So I do not think his uh, hyper is that much of an issue. So for him, I just need to work on this part only. So this nocturnal hypoglycemia only, and that's all for him. So um, this is one of the few occasions that I feel that better glucose monitoring system will translate into a better insulin um, treatment delivery. Last but not least, um, especially during COVID time, like how do we work with patients who are on insulin, right? Because many of our patients, they cannot come to the clinic. Um, they are on insulin, they are checking the SMBG, but they don't have anyone to show their SMBG to. They, 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 they don't have anyone to supervise their progress or to suggest whether they need to change to intensify more treatment or not. So this is where we come in. And we, I have developed this. I mean, I'm personally involved in development of this for since, since last year. And we have worked on the like, sort of like a, a, a generalized framework for, for teleconsultation. Um, and I personally have been running it since September last year as well um, to see my patient with uh, type 2 diabetes who are on insulin. And the process is really quite simple. You know, They just need to make sure that they know how to use teleconsultation, either Zoom or Google Meet, because this will be integrated in our EMR. They just need to have a data ready for me. So it means either SMBG data or blood test report. Most of the time, it's going to be SMBG data. And they just need to deliver the data to me, like either by email or by WhatsApp, or sometimes they just read the, read the numbers to me. And what I find so far is that patients so far are very highly receptive of the teleconsultation services. And they, they really like it because it's very convenient. It's very short. One visit can last maybe just about 10, 15 minutes only. And, and that's a lot more convenient for them rather than come to hospital, find a car park, uh, wait in the waiting area, and then see doctor for 10 minutes. And then after that, done for like half and half a day, go on just to see doctor for 10 minutes. Huh? And, and I, 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 I find that most patients, they, they really enjoy or they, they are very receptive of these services. And there was initially we had concern whether it's going to be difficult to address clinical issues uh, during teleconsultation. And I find this is not the case actually, because as long as I stick to the, to the, to the narrow scope of the teleconsultation itself, i.e. for example, in my patient with diabetes, it's going to be about insulin titration. Most clinical scenarios can be addressed during teleconsultation. I mean, if you want to start to address new symptoms, for example, there might be a bit of an issue, lah, but if you want to address like, insulin titration, hypoglycemia, uh, glucose monitoring, those can be addressed easily within 10 to 15 minutes. And so far, I've not had any adverse effect, um, no medication error. So far, there's no issue about clinical decision making, about communication breakdown or anything. And, and luckily, our indemnity providers are willing to cover for, for our services as well. So again, I'm not, I don't have to worry so much about um, medical legal issues uh, of it. Lah. So I think that's all for, for today. Um, I would like to hear what are your challenges and maybe if you have an idea how to overcome that, you can share with us as well. Um, I think, yeah, I, 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 like I said, I, I, I cannot promise I can solve all your problems. Maybe we can just share how we each solve each other's problem. That would be a better, um, better concept for this meeting. So thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lokman, uh, for that very... Uh, interesting presentation, nothing more of a practical uh, approach on how to um, of course, address issues with uh, uh, patients on insulin. 
Uh, are there any questions or any uh, ones want to share um, the concern or the issues with uh, treating their patients? Uh, you can always start the question uh, in the chat box or I suppose you can even ask the question. By the way, uh, let me just list out the SMBG devices with the Bluetooth just now in case you miss it because I forgot to put it in the slide. Huh? Um, the, I just type it in the check box here. It's going to be a quick check uh, uh, guide and contour plus one. Yeah. So because the other uh, models, they don't have uh, Bluetooth, so they might not play with it. They might not work with the apps um, that I just showed to you. Um, do you want to share any of your ideas or, or, or any some other uh, issues that you face or, or you, I don't know, you, you might want to ask the panelists on how you solve the problem because we have Prof Mahozi here who are very experienced. Um, I mean, I can share, I can try to give opinion if, if I have encountered the same problem as well. Questions, are you all uh, happy in dealing with uh, insulin? Give insulin to your patients. Uh, perhaps uh, you know you can share your experience. I think the uh, the doctor Nokman has given his uh, way of how to address the the various concerns that uh, patients may have okay, with insulin. Perhaps you can also share uh, how your your of your tips, how you uh, get around patients' reluctance or patients on insulin but uh, unable to control their blood sugars and, and so on. Um, as I think Dr. Lockman uh, showed in the LA data, uh, our, our data showed that in general, um, our doctors and even patients uh, tend to accept insulin therapy. Okay, when you look at the, from the dark care uh, data, that they were even willing to go on the uh, bolus, um, uh, bolus, uh, basal bolus regime okay, for type 2 diabetes. But when you look at the control, you know, um, if, despite being on uh, intensive uh, insulin therapy, many of them don't achieve control. Perhaps I can ask uh, the, uh, the participants of the audience, why do you think even patients who are in your, your patients, even though are they are on, on may, maybe multiple premixes or basal bolus, but they're still not able to achieve uh, control? And how do you sort of get around to get your patients to achieve control? Right? Perhaps um, anyone can share your experience? Quiet so far. <laughs> Our panelists, they many typing. Eh? Oh. Dr. Lohman, I have a question. Yep. Ah, okay. Um, what is your experience uh, dealing with pregnant women with very difficult to control diabetes and they are already on like very high insulin therapy? What okay. Do we, what do we? Do? Yeah. What good do we question. Do? Good, good question. Huh? Um, recently, we had a we, recently we had a patient who require very high doses. But I have to say, I have to say uh, as a disclaimer that I did not manage this patient directly. I knew because this was uh, we managed this in our unit, but I didn't see the patient myself uh, personally. So what happened is that she requires very high doses of insulin. I think about more than a hundred unit plus per day, which we, which is usually rather quite unusual for for people uh, with pregnancy. Yeah. And um, what we did, uh, basically what Jaya and Shamila did like, at that time because they were managing the patient, they started the patient on insulin pump actually. And this is a patient who has, this is a patient who has type 2, not type 1. So they started on insulin pump and the basal insulin requirement uh, dropped to by about 70 to 80% with insulin pump. So I think what that's one of the way, uh, I mean, one of the ways to look at it. Of course, I'm not saying that all patients need to start on insulin pump. If your patient have very high um, insulin requirement, I think there are some issues usually that we need to address things like macam their injection technique, compliance, um, diet, and all semua. But I would say for your question, there's no, I can't say there's, a, there's an easy answer to that. There would be a very individualized question. I have one patient who's, glucose is not 
as perfect as I would rather I would rather want it to be lah. She's her glucose is about in the high six, in the low seven like that during pregnancy yeah. The prenatal glucose is about six point seven, seven point one like that. So I'm not very happy with the glucose. I advised the patient for admission to to control her blood glucose, but the patient was very reluctant for admission. And then we discussed with our gynae, and our gynae did a serious scan and found that the baby was okay. And then we came to the agreement that maybe it's fine not to force the patient to accept treatment that they are not willing to take. Lah. So given that the fetal health is is fine, fetal growth is fine, so both ourselves and the gynecologist feel that um, it's okay to just let it be. I, I don't know what, what do you think, Prof, Prof Ma? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's sometimes difficult uh, to treat these patients. But I suppose you really have to try your best yeah? yep. uh, into and trying to get the glucose uh, control simply because uh, poor glucose control have a significant effect on the uh, on the fetal well-being. Yeah. yeah, but now people are talking about individualized target, right? Mm, the For type yeah. 1 and type 2, but but I don't think this is an issue that this is a concept that has encroached into pregnancy. That's right. Pregnancy uh, is one standard. Pregnancy is, <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, it's sort of like, like one standard. Are your patient is compliant ke, motivated ke, not motivated ke, like very yeah. poor resource ke, not compliant ke, sama je standard. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, in terms of just the fasting sugars and the postprandial sugars. So I'm, I'm not sure if this is something that people are going to look back in the, uh, look again, revise back in the future. You know? uh, what do you think, yeah. Prof? Uh, I don't, well, not really, because uh, at, the, at the end of the day, I think the, the main yeah. objective in treating uh, diabetes in pregnancy or gestational yeah. diabetes is the fetal well being. And yeah. Uh, yeah. so far, uh, unlike, for instance, uh, adult diabetes, non pregnant diabetes, of course, because your main aim is to prevent long term complication, both the macrovascular and the microvascular complication. And depend on the patient's comorbidity, then perhaps your target can be a bit more lenient. Uh, because yeah. they don't need to be such strict, uh, strict to get the uh, A1C or the glycemia uh, to target uh, once one size fits all. But if for pregnancy, still not my choice. You, it's the fetal well being. And at the end of the day, I think if you explain that to the uh, woman and that it's your baby is a stick, uh, uh, then perhaps they tend, be a bit more, they tend to be a bit more compliant uh, compared to when they are uh, not pregnant. So I think you, you really have to you know, sort of uh, uh, drum it to your patient that look, we have to achieve this, otherwise your baby is not going to be fine. <laughs> so, okay, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, first question is that uh, if a patient cannot afford the frequent self-monitoring blood glucose, yeah, how would you advise on the frequency and timing of blood glucose, pre-meal or postprandial? Okay, um, for, for my practice, uh, of course, I, I, I mean, you, I, as you all would have been aware by now, Malaysia does have our own, we do have our own uh, SMBG guidelines um, on the structure, how to check the structure SMBG. For my practice, uh, I agree with the current trend to individualize SMBG. And I think um, if you look at uh, DCCT, right, where they require seven, four to 10 times of SMBG, and this has long been the standard of care for type 1 diabetes. Uh, even now, also people are talking about individual, individualization of the um, SMBG frequency and, 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 and timing as well. So I think a good way forward is really to individualize uh, your target for both type 1 and type 2. Lah, yeah? Of course, type 1, they need to monitor more frequent. But for type 2, which I think most of us manage, um, it depends on what I want to work on. Okay, For example, uh, if let's say, uh, I have a patient, remember the one that I met in your MSC, the example that I showed you, if you notice that that man only checked uh, the prenatal glucose one time only, the rest he only checked fasting glucose, and that is because I told him so. So when he came in with the HbA1c of uh, 14 at that time, and I started him on one injection per day, um, in theory, I just need to check one time a day to titrate that one injection per day. So when I started him on a pre-dinner, uh, premix, for example, I just need to check fasting glucose and then I titrate based on the based on the fasting glucose. The same goes with basal insulin as well. So if let's say I started him on one injection, I just need to check one time only. If let's say I sometimes I see patients who are on multiple daily dose, for example, but their HbA1c is bad, and I think um, I need to work on fixing fasting first, fix, fixing the fasting glucose first. Even in such a patient also, I may still ask the patient to just check once a day only just so that they can fix the fasting glucose first. Once the fasting glucose is fixed, then only I go 
to to uh, to the rest of the appendix glucose. Um, we have done this for the past two years. We have run a very uh, SMBG driven uh, insulin clinic um, in our place. And from our experience, uh, I don't have hard number to audit this, but subjective, subjectively from my experience, the basal titration alone uh, will bring down the glucose to about maybe 70 to 80% of the, of the overall uh, insulin efficacy is going to come from optimizing the, the, the uh, basal insulin uh, alone. And the prandial insulin optimization, where you need to check more frequent SMBG, right, is going to contribute maybe about 20, 30 percent only of all the um, HbA1c fine tuning. So really, the best bang for the buck for you, if let's say your patient is really quite resource limited, is going to be the basal insulin and the optimization of the basal insulin. Once I optimize the basal insulin, then I need to go to uh, prandial optimization. And this depends. Sometimes they may check, patient may check three times a day. Sometimes patient may check four times a day. But sometimes at the time, they might just check twice a day only. So sometimes the minimum, I tell them, maybe check one at breakfast, one at dinner. And then we just take one reading for fasting, one reading for prandial. And then we try to work on that. In general, I try to aim their readings to be less than seven for all readings, uh, pre-meal regardless of breakfast, lunch or dinner. Yeah. Okay. Next question is that uh, this is regarding post-COVID patients. Huh? Uh, COVID patients have uh, a very high dose of dexamethasone. So after they finish the dexamethasone, okay, how do you de-escalate anti-diabetic medication to prevent hypoglycemia? Okay, um, difficult question actually, uh, because there's no easy answer. Um, we did discuss with this among our unit, uh, among our unit, and we need to come up with the algorithm on how to manage uh, post-COVID uh, hypoglycemia. Um, I have had a patient who who received uh, um, dexamethasone, and and they developed hyperglycemia in the hospital, and then once the dexamethasone is stopped, their hyperglycemia tends to improve um, rather quite, uh, I would say quite quite fast like actually quite quite promptly within within uh, forty eight to seventy two hours because most patients in our ward they receive injectable. Uh, parenteral dexamethasone. So they will stay throughout the dexamethasone treatment and their glucose will be monitored by the nurse in the ward. So for me, I find dexamethasone, yes, it does cause hypoglycemia, but by the time of discharge, their glucose would have gone down to a more reasonable level that can be managed by, by many primary care. Um, what I do find a problem is patients who dose with the OP, those with the organizing pneumonia, right, who receive uh, penicillin. And this is where the glucose can drag for weeks, if not months lah, um, of hyperglycemia. Um, I do feel that if I, if I can offer telemedicine for such a patient, it would be very helpful. Uh, but I, would have, I have to say, I have not managed a lot of COVID so far um, because we take turns. Lah, and yeah, I mean, my turn, that day baru two weeks and then it's going to come up soon. Um, from what I have managed so far is that I have had patients who who receive uh, prednisolone and develop hyperglycemia at home. I tried to enroll him for telemedicine but somehow he cannot do telemedicine so he ended up just testing me his blood glucose. So and then I tried to um, adjust his blood glucose uh, based on his reading. Although this is not what I would recommend for most people because it's risky. It's medically legally risky as well. Um, you, you are prone to make error. Lah. Um, whether you can accommodate them in your clinic during this COVID time, I think it's going to be rather quite highly unlikely though, unless you stay in Perlis. Ah. But um, otherwise in Klang Valley, it's, it's very highly unlikely that you can accommodate uh, this hyperglycemic patient in your clinic just to walk in uh, because of the shortage of manpower. That's why I said this is a this is a difficult question actually is we are quite uh, bound in, in many ways. Lah. Um, one of the way to do it is maybe to enlist more primary care uh, to manage uh, this hyperglycemia because at the end of the day as long as these patients are not very not overtly symptomatic from hyperglycemia they are not dehydrated they are not let's say they are not in diabetic emergency right um, I, we feel that to a certain extent, we can make a compromise and let uh, primary care manage this patient. Um, and they can always refer back to us if they have issue, if they have problem with managing the diabetes. But then again, I feel we should keep our expectation realistic. Like for example, if patient is on high dose steroid, um, 
I think it's a bit unrealistic to expect the glucose to be normal. Sometimes glucose in the teens might be the best that we can we can do until they are taken off their steroids. Lah. Sorry, Prof, you're muted. All right, okay. Uh, it's a frequent uh, small meal better than three meals a day. Uh, um, patient on insulin. <laughs> yeah, it's frequent small meal better than three meals in a day. Okay, if you ask me, the best meal is what the patient can maintain. So if let's say the patient is used to take three meals in a day, right? I won't change it to frequent small meals. If the patient is used to take frequent meals, small frequent meals, I will not change it to three meals in a day. I would try to adjust uh, treatment based on their meal pattern rather than the other way around. Meal pattern, adjust meal pattern based on their treatment. That, I mean, that's my approach. What, what do you, what's, what's your approach? Bro? Yeah, I think uh, for patients who are on primary insulin, it looks like they may have to have uh, the frequent meals, and not so called the, 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 the main meals, okay? because they are yeah. on, on prandial insulin. And then they may probably need to have a snack in between uh, to prevent hypoglycemia. Uh, but if you, they were to take uh, small meals throughout the day, then it may be an issue if they are on prandial. If they are on, say, on basal yep. insulin yep. Uh, plus uh, oral, then that may be a, a, a suitable way. Okay? I, do, I do have a propensity to use premixed TDS for patients who take small cups. No? Uh, right. exactly. Because their prandial component is lower, right? So I, yes, I, exactly. if I see them on basal bolus and they take small amount of cup, I do tend to change their, uh, mm -hmm. their, their treatment itself. And I, I try my best not to change diet unless I really have to. That's right, yes. I think I bet it's better to fit the insulin to the patient's yeah. diet <laughs> rather than get the patient <laughs> the insulin Rather regime. than get the diet fixed That's the right. insulin regime, right? Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So... Uh, I think another question, I think this is probably the last question as so we're running out short time. If the patient really don't can't afford uh, the SMBG, okay, and what is the minimum requirement for SMBG that is, that's really required? Okay, this question, very interesting. The uh, minimum very practical question. No? Uh. Um, if I were to give a very, very, very minimum requirement, I would say maybe one week before appointment. I I probably say one week before appointment. Am I comfortable to adjust insulin dose purely based on HbA1c and one fasting blood glucose on the lab? Huh? I'm, I used to do that when I was a lot younger, but I, looking back, it's really a random shot in the dark. You see, I mean, you don't know why the HbA1c is high. You don't know whether this is fasting or prandial hyperglycemia. You just main tembak <laughs> that kind of insulin dose. There. It's really a shot in the dark, and and I feel it might be dangerous. Uh, the minimum I would say maybe one week before appointment, like at least you have some diagnostic mm -hmm. idea whether it's prandial or uh, fasting, and then you can you know where to target on your HbA1c mm -hmm. lowering. Sometimes so I do is that because you know some of these patients they stay in the kampung, they have a near clinic be done mm -hmm. or clinic kesihatan nearby. I tell them yeah. sometimes to go to the clinic check the uh, glucose maybe um, once a week or even twice a week. But obviously this patient can only be on sort of a basal insulin yep, yep. Uh, because you can titrate basal insulin based on just once or twice weekly uh, 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 pre-meal uh, sugar. Uh, but yeah. uh, if they're on the premix or basal bolus, that's almost difficult uh, to do that. Uh, if they can really kind of afford them. I, I, I also tend to, I also tend to see patient uh, sort of like, I mean, this is not an official hospital policy, but I do, I do tend to see them back repeatedly so it means that if let's say they come to me one time with a high hba1c but with a let's say on basal bolus insulin but with a normal fasting glucose for example mm -hmm. and i know that my next visit i want to intervene on um prandial glucose but i just need to collect the data so maybe next time i just tell them instead of check prandial check fasting and maybe check prandial for mm -hmm. one week before and then come to me with the prandial reading that, that instead of a um, instead of a fasting reading so because in that sense i have plans for next two, three visits uh, in advance rather than just plan for one visit. Mm. Okay, I think I think the last question, because we're just uh, short, is that, uh, is it possible to revert this patient back to OAD? Uh, because uh, especially obese patients, <laughs> they're put on insulin initially, and, yeah. because, and there is insulin, relative insulin deficiency. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, in medicine, you know, like, nothing is impossible, like, but practically speaking, Practically speaking, no lah. Short of short of very dramatic, uh, weight loss or or very bad organ dysfunction, ah, um, no lah. Practically speaking, but yeah lah. But you say nothing is possible. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I patients really obese. Maybe yeah. started on insulin. 
uh, probably for, uh, for maybe a relative insulin deficiency, they can lose yep. weight. Huh? Uh, yep, because quite significant weight loss, more than 10% of the body weight. Yep. Uh, then perhaps uh, they can uh, be back on the oral. The, the, okay. boy that, the, the boy that I showed in the case, actually with the A1C of 14, I did start, her, start him on basal bolus insulin with anticipation that he needs basal bolus because A1C is very high. Eh? But turns out he doesn't need basal bolus. So in fact, he stopped prandial insulin. So I think, yeah, there might be occasions like that. Hmm. But I can't say it's a, I can't, I can't say it's a, a norm. Lah. Okay, I think since uh, we are uh, short, uh, short of time, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lokman, for that very okay, thanks, interesting talk for and, then, yeah. and a very interesting uh, discussion as well. Okay? And I also like to thank all of you for participating in this afternoon's um, webinar. Okay, I hope you have uh, learned something from this. I'm sure you do. Uh, and perhaps I think uh, next week will be another uh, session okay? uh, of, on the endocrine uh, month of the webinar. So again, uh, thank you very much for participating and thank you the organizers for um, organizing this meeting. And uh, to all of you, uh, have a nice day and uh, stay safe, everyone. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Inshallah. Thanks, bro. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, due to technical issue from uh, MMA side, uh, there won't be any QR code issued this for this month. So we will key in the CPD points uh, for you all. Thank you. Thank you.